So Maria, for people joining this as a video and not a live stream, uh, what are we doing today and why are we doing it? Hi guys. So we are uh, a week late due to technical difficulties, finally getting around to our Patreon live stream of review of the Poppy War. Oh God, why do I always forget the, the author's names? It's R.F. Kuang? 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 Uh, I have this habit of pronouncing all foreign words like they're Spanish, but... <laughs> you, you do. You absolutely yeah, do. Um, but, yeah, and we tried to do it last week. It didn't work, so we're doing it this week, baby. Uh, I have lost a lot of the plot. We're going to be mainly talking <laughs> about... Um, I was telling my mom yesterday about trying to, why I didn't, or the problems I had with the book, and I couldn't remember any of them. And I'm like, okay, this is a good recap then. It'll uh, be. My mom, be by the fun. way, what's up? Um, I'll try to talk less about SEX this video. Luckily, there's none to really be spoken about. That's true. That's true. This but is uh, one I was... of those books where we don't have to talk about it. She's always good at making me actually say specifics because she's always like, okay, but be specific. Don't just tell me the general. And I'm like, oh, that's so much. Yeah, but uh yeah well usually it comes back as we do the actual summary yeah. so uh that should be pretty easy yeah this was a book um from our patreon uh book club you guys can join um in the link below the video um it was one that uh, i think won pretty handily it's one i had actually had my eye on for a little bit um because it seemed kind of interesting and the cover art was nice and a lot um, of people recommended it in response to another video we had done they were like if you want a better version of this read the poppy war and like it, it weirdly enough it, just in our comments it got mentioned mm -hmm. enough times for me to like remember it existed <laughs> um and it was also one that like as because as we do with our discord as we pick the book throughout the month people read it and comment on it and this book got a lot of discussion uh there was a lot of feelings to be had um and i'm i'm excited because you guys had such good and like last week when we were trying to do this video and it didn't work out i just talked in discord with some people about our like feelings and honestly our patrons yeah. have such great takes on this book and pinpointing the things that don't really work so i'm really excited to actually talk about it with you guys and go into it uh and all that oh iron widow that might have been one of the ones that uh this got commented on for um and and i can see why but we'll get into it yeah this is going to be an interesting one to talk about i uh, didn't get a chance to check our discord um though even though like the whole Look. month leading up to it no, I wasn't able to check the Discord uh, discussion on it. Um, yeah, because I like I should have, but I just didn't go back after last week, and my memory is terrible. So I remember uh, uh, pretty much uh, very little. So you guys in the chat will have to remind me. Um, what were your overall feelings about this book, Maria? And also, uh, you guys in the chat, while she's doing that, you guys leave your comments about what you thought overall, and we'll you know discuss engagement. Engagement, engagement. Um, so this book had a lot of good things about it, especially in the beginning. I I think the writer is not. Why am I suddenly tiny? I'm trying what to the do fuck spotlight, did you do? but for some reason it was like, oh, I'm I'm talking now. This isn't <laughs> you. Why am I tiny? It's supposed to do the spotlight, but for some reason it decided that uh, I was the one who was talking. That doesn't make any sense. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Uh... Piss it. There we um, go. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so uh, at the start, I enjoyed it way more. And like the writer's like actual writing mechanics are really nice. She has some really good descriptions. Um, but there was just so much. And somebody in the... Um, our comments just said too much telling, no showing. Marika said that. Uh, and that's oh, watch so... this, watch this with this new software we're doing. Oh, oh, look at that. Ooh, you guys have got a spotlight. Screen. Um, and that is a huge problem I had with this book. I have a lot of problems. I I I think it's a good book and it was very readable. Like I I kind of finished it pretty quickly. For... But it's fucking long, man. It's a big, it's a it's a chonky boy of a book um but it 
the characters' motivations were incredibly, the main characters' motivations were incredibly inconsistent. The book should have been three separate books. A lot of people had mentioned that had this been a manga or an anime, it would have worked significantly better because within mangas and animes, there are smaller arcs that you can follow the characters grow through their motivations through one arc. And they're not necessarily the same arc to arc to arc. Like Ichigo at the end of Bleach is not Ichigo at the start of Bleach. Like even like the first 10 volumes versus the last 10 volumes, you're dealing with very different character motivations. Um, but because this book was one giant book, we follow her through a bunch of contradictory motivations. Um, the characters around her feel very inconsistent. There's one character, uh, Alton, who felt, and, and this might have been me, but you guys let me know what you think. But uh, I felt, I thought he was kind of inconsistent uh, in his presentation. Um, and there was just so many things that, like, in Cyborg Tinker, when I was like, there's too many things, you got to have less things. This was one of those instances. It was trying to be like military school novel. It was trying to be like historical retake. It was trying to be like uh, shamanism and magic and like centering. And then it was also like mass murder. Destruct like there was just so many things. I think part of the issue is that it's not just that there were a lot of arcs within it because there are, this is like three books put together. The problem is that each of those arcs is a different genre of story. So you have the first part, which is school story. Then you have war story, and then you have genocide story, essentially. And, and then all over all of that is like shamanism story. Yeah, I'm gonna just be honest uh, in terms of my general impressions. I think this book is kind of a mess. I don't think it's terrible in that her writing is her writing is fair. She has a problem where she does a lot more telling than she does showing. Um, and also, I think her descriptions are not great in that I was having trouble picturing a lot of this book. Um, and then, but I think the big problems with it are the messiness of the story and also the kind of allegorical storytelling she's trying to do, which I'll talk about. Um, there's some interviews with her. In certain ways, it's good that we weren't able to do this last week because I was able to look at some interviews with her and think a little bit more about the story and get a better context for it. In other ways, it's bad because now I don't remember as much of it. But oh, there was also a class, like a class and where you were born was also a thing. <clears throat> Too many layers to the onion. Uh, sorry, Will, I, didn't, I just remember that. I mean mm -hmm. it, that's okay we have the dual screen right now so both of us are equally uh talking um all right let's take a look at um oh, the comments there are some good <laughs> ones uh amanda said despite the problems i would still recommend it for people looking for a fresh take on high fantasy war novel and honestly i probably would as well um i think there are ways in which it though i will say i i texted will at one point and i was like do I not just like, do I just not like war novels? Like, is that a problem I have? And he goes, you say what you said. I'm not going to speak for you. I, I, I said that this is not a very good example of it. And it's kind of boring. Um, and I think that's, that's true. It's oh, not no, a no, very. No, that's not the important part. He loves war novels. He loves. Oh, that's true. I do. Yeah. I absolutely love mi military history fiction. military fiction i listened i re-listened at one point to a nine-hour podcast about the genghis khan mongol um invasions because i just love that stuff did. so much uh dan carlin's hardcore history what's up um yeah no and i will enjoy that a lot more of the than a lot of the books we've read so far uh, i love military history this is not a good example of it part of the problem too is we go from training school arc to now we're doing more training but now sometimes there's war going on as well and it just wasn't i and, i go ahead and the author is trying to say something because like the military is very incompetent like they make a lot of like at no point do you feel like okay this is a a war being fought between two edu which is which really undermines her entire time at the academy um the fact that the military is just so dysfunctional. Now, granted, the author did that on purpose because she was trying to mirror the, like, dysfunction of, like, the Chinese military in World War II against Japan, um, which, like, I get. But it made me taking the academy that she was at, that was the entire first third of the book, like, I how am I supposed to take any of those people seriously? 
at all. Um, so Lindbergh, watch this, guys. Bam. It's on screen now. She said, um, I think sometimes the focus revolved a bit too much around the themes the author wanted to portray, and she forgot to craft a living, immersive experience. Um, I think this is so totally true. Um, the author has a problem with telling, not showing, um, as they as they say. And also, I think this is a good time to bring up that this is very much an allegorical story that's trying to follow the beats of the world. So I can't put them on screen because I don't have the technology yet, but um, I screen capped a few of her uh, things she said in interviews. So at one point she said, this story has to be Rin's story because it's a tragic villain origin story. Minor spoiler here, Rin's life is meant to parallel the trajectory of Mao Zedong from obscurity in Hunan to a genocidal dictator leading millions. I wanted to explore the psychology of a dictator. How do you go from the roots that Mao and Rin had to holding unimaginable power and causing so much suffering? How do you mentally justify yourself? How do you mentally justify that to yourself? And then at another point, she says, um, oh, she just says some of the other authors who tried to, uh, um, uh, who influenced her, but it's not important. Um, so, and that's the thing. This is a very clear parallel to what was happening in World War II with the Japanese and the Chinese. Uh, the, Ch the Japanese analog here is called the Mugen. Um, and I hate, <laughs> that's one of the things I've realized that since we started this podcast is I really dislike when books do the whole, this is a stand in for this historical event or group. And I hate that because I find that you a, should just be talking about that group. I don't understand why you're talking about a different situation but with a lot of the little details changed because i think when you change a lot of the little details there's so much context there's so much context so for one example i really like is um district nine to explain this district nine for those people who don't know is about um an alien ghetto in south africa and a lot of people thought it was a and i actually don't know what the the um director uh blomkamp i think is his name uh was trying to do with it but as a my screen is here. Let me go full screen so you guys can see my cool hand gestures. As a story about aliens and marginalization and stuff, I think it's an excellent story. I think it's a really good movie. As an allegory for apartheid, I think it's really bad and problematic. So for example, these are like, they call them prawns. They're kind of insectile aliens, right? And um, they have like worker drones and then a higher cast that's kind of smarter. And that is okay if you're talking about aliens, so long as you're examining it. But as an allegory for black people and some people being genetically more intelligent than other people, super problematic. Um, and so when you change the context of things, which this book does change the context of, of what was happening at that time period and the events that go on, I think you lead to a lot of run-on sort of butterfly effect problems in terms of the story you're trying to tell. And also I think in this case, you mostly just understand the book as a bunch of references to real life events and not so much as a coherent story in its own right. Yeah. I think one of the best examples, oh, now I'm back, hi. I think one of the best examples of how this gets really problematic, it, for me, one of the most weird decisions, and I, again, I'm not going to speak for what I think the author was trying to do. I'm not exactly sure what, sh like with this particular thing, but our main character, who is part of the stand-in world okay. for China. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Uh, Silken Bland said, I hate that it draws a parallel to Mao because it makes an analogy between one of the most controversial characters in history to a teenage girl throwing a tantrum. <laughs> very fair. Very fair. Yeah. And then uh, Lindbergh said, uh, I mean that she oh uh i think he said something or she said something earlier or they said something oh uh, which uh one? i mean that she wanted to reflect mao uh did in no way impact the way i experienced the story when you're creating a low fantasy it will have to stand on its own which i completely agree with i don't think this does i think it is too tied i think <clears throat> she made things too obvious in their connections um and which brings all the cultural context of the reality, the historical reality we live with. And again, the thing for me was that our main character, uh, Rin, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, like she, she it was the uh, atomic bomb. She destroys all of Mugen, which is the stand-in for Japan. And this is like symbolically the U.S., drop in uh the atomic bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki 
the thing is, that was a Western power trying yes. to make a move to debilitate, to bring a war to an end sooner. And it's really weird to place that in the responsibility of one person. Um, and it's it just also like changes it fundamentally if the Chinese are doing it after the rape of Nanking as revenge Nanjing. for that. I always thought it was Nanking. That's they, that was the old Romanization, but they've changed it recently. Okay, to Nanjing. weird. Quick rant. Why are there weird Romaniz Romanizations of Chinese and Asian? Why don't words? we just say it the way they're phonetically? Said? Yeah, it's not like. French or Spanish or um, any of the other Romance languages where they have their spelling because they also have uh, Arabic letters. But like, yeah, no, I don't understand why Genghis wasn't immediately Genghis. Anyway, sorry, back on point. Um, yeah, it it changes it fundamentally of the a um, revenge of a character who had to live through these events and who is dealing with a Japan Mugen who is still in the midst of invading her country and doing so very effectively decides to genocide an entire Island versus a Western power who is dealing with a Japan that is already contained and has lost the war yeah. and also kind of was doing it to show the Soviets we could use nukes. I mean, there's, yes. there's a lot of other there's, history going and it was on. A thought with out, it was a thought out decision because Amanda points out also, it's not like a thought out decision. It is just done in anger and she doesn't remember doing it. And so it's just a really weird. And because the thing is, she is trying to recontextualize these things. The author is trying to say something about it. I am not entirely sure though, what the author is trying to say about these events, other than this is bad. Um, and one thing I will say, um, one of our complaints in Iron Widow that we had was that the book itself did not seem to condemn the actions of the main character. A lot of people responded to us being like, the book paints her as a good character and doesn't condemn her actions. And she's like almost painted to be justified. And then people were like, no, it's from her point of view. So of course uh, she thinks she's right and she's okay. The book isn't saying those are the right things to do this book is saying it's not the right things to do. There are multiple characters who look at the actions of our main character and go, mm, that ain't it, babe. Like, here's the things, the correct ways to handle things, and here's what you're doing. And people around her are horrified by her actions. The, she has a, a friend, Kitai, um, and Kitai would have been the stand-in in Iron Widow for um, the guys, uh, the main character in that were friends with and who were partnering with her. And like, Kitai at one point is like, oh no, you did that. You that was not good. <laughs> that was a terrible decision. Holy shit. And so you're like, oh, okay, the book knows that this is wrong. The author is not trying to, I think, um make her sympathetic necessarily. I do get that she's trying to explore how you go from like kind of a normal person to a dictator. But again, as far as the like rape of Nanjing or the excuse me, the grip of Nanjing and the massacre, we'll say the massacre of Nanjing and uh, the atomic bomb for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm not sure what more she's like, what is she adding by including those things besides things. shock and horror that yeah, already she, happened because that's what we experienced in history. <laughs> like we already got shock and horror from that. Yeah. Two things. One, um, I've often said that if you're going to go dark, you need to actually be good at it because you know, a poorly written, lighthearted story is kind of enjoyable to read whereas a poorly written dark story is not fun to read and the other problem is that when you're dealing with certain subjects the quality of how you do it actually matters towards the how morally okay it is so for example if you make a dumb not very if you try to make a good fart joke and you make a bad one whatever nobody cares if you try to make a good holocaust joke and make a bad one morally that's not okay same thing with like a, a, a grape joke. Like if you mess that up, it's a problem. Whereas if you mess up a fart joke, it's not a problem. And so in this case, her, the quality of like telling, not showing, a certain amount of um, non-nuance in the characters and themes, that becomes a problem. The other thing is that I felt at the end of the book, yes, the author portrays it as a bad thing. Um, and one of the ways she does that too is that the character herself is starting to have to like... Um, uh, not deal with part of that in her mind. She's having to block it off. But I, I don't under think the author fully understands that the character did a genocide, like a lot. And so, um, and not just Lindbergh like, and said, 
hold on real oh, quick. Sorry. In one way, reading the whole trilogy did a lot to change my view opinion of the Poppy War. I felt the third book went a lot of way toward consolidating the mess of the first novel going full circle. And so that is one of the things I was kind of wondering is how much this is dealt with in the sequels. Um, Marika says um, she doesn't face any consequences for the action, like the genocide down the line. Uh, a couple of, of cup, and then Amanda said in, I think, response to Lindbergh, I agree. I view some of it more fondly after almost finishing the second book. Um, so it, I do think that maybe down the line, this is dealt with a bit better, but in this book, it just was really odd. Some of the, the decisions. And again, it was, it was a hard book to read and not that all that books should be easy. It was immensely readable, but there were moments that were really hard because I wasn't just, it, it wasn't just this moment in this book. It was the entire historical context and also me drawing differences to like, Okay, you because not uh, the other difference between the book's uh, destruction of Mugen and Hiroshima and Nag the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, is that the entire island is decimated. Like the entire thing, there is no Mugen left except for the people that are currently invading her country, the army on the ground, um, and that that's just like a, a, a. I'm not sure what the escalation does. I'm not sure I, with the escalation of making it the entire, like a, a complete almost genocide. Uh, Cause the other thing you have to think about the majority of the people who are uh, in uh, Nikan at this point are men. It's an army. Uh, so like they can't really rebuild. Um, but I don't know why that was the move. It's an odd decision because Maria <laughs> complained this about this to me and it's totally true. Her motivation goes through several escalations but you're never there for the organic point from where it goes from i don't want to get married to i now want to be the best military person to i want all the power to i want to kill all I want of to the destroy Mugen. this entire race yeah it's and almost like it jumps while you weren't watching and so like her final decision to hey <laughs> She makes a deal with the Phoenix of, hey, I'll kill you. If you do this thing for me, I'll then do bad things. And the bad thing that she wants him to do is the destruction of the island, where it feels a lot more like if the, the, the Phoenix should have been like, hey, if you want my power, you need to kill all these people. That would have made a little bit more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an odd escalation in terms of the motivations. I think we're talking maybe a little bit much about this before yeah. we've actually explained the context. I yeah. think when we run through the, the plot of this book, though, we should probably do so somewhat minimally because oh, we are there's so much of it. We have to do it minimally. I, it's been a week. I've read several books since then. <laughs> like, I, I don't I don't got all of that. Um, so this book... Oh God, the start of it. I'm about to say the start <laughs> of it, and it is so different from everything else we're talking about. Uh, the, this book starts with our main character, Rin. Uh, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, our main character, Rin, uh, is getting ready for the, uh, like, oh God, what is it called? Oh my god, I, I memorized and pronounced this word a bunch of times, so I'd be able to... Uh, the SAT. Uh, it's, it's the... Uh, in ancient China, there was the... The SAT. Uh, it, it, like the SAT. The it LSAT. Was, um, it, the big exam you could take, and it it went from, like, uh, lore, politics, uh, logic, a bunch of things. You took it. If you passed with a certain score, you could move up in society. And uh, it was a meritocracy uh, in theory, but you know, the people who had enough time to study and actually do well on this exam were the rich people. And so our main character, Ren, is the Kudju. Thank you, ba, ba, ba. the Kudju. Um, Lindbergh coming in clutch. Uh, and uh, how the Kudju functioned was to like move people uh, in theory, move people from one strat of society to another. Our main character, Rin, she's the lowest of the low. She's a war orphan. Her country, uh, Nikon, Nikara, um, was, uh, had a lot of wars recently. There was two poppy wars. At the end of the second poppy war, she was a little war orphan, and the country decided uh, families who had only, who had less than one kid needed to adopt war orphans. And she was adopted into a real, no good, very bad family. They are opium peddlers, smugglers, uh, creators. Already, I have to stop you because I hate it. 
there's this thing in the in the book, and this is one of the ways that I think the book doesn't remix history well about how the Mugen are funneling in opium to weaken uh, Nikon. This, I think, is supposed to be a reference back to how the British did that to kind of screw with the Chinese because the Chinese wouldn't give them the trade rights they wanted. But changing it to the Mugen, again, that's a very different relationship than the one the British had to China. And we'll learn later that Hesperia, the Western analog, is actually mostly chill about China. Like they they helped them out when the Mugen tried to invade the second time. In the second and third books, I think more happens with them. But again, it's this thing where you're recontextualizing history in a way that doesn't totally make sense. And in the book, it's kind of never explored why opium is such a bad thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's a problem. But uh, her, she's grown up as a shop girl for them. She also like helps carry opium to people sometimes, but her uh, like adoptive mother is very abusive. Uh, not a very nice lady. The husband is hopped up on opium all the time. So it's pretty much this woman uh, in charge of everything. Who's not very nice. And the book uh, opens with the book actually opens with her sitting down to take the exam, but then you get a flashback through a series of being told stuff, uh, some telling, um, that she was presented to a matchmaker who was like, we're going to marry you to like a 50 year old man. Uh, he is a merchant in the area. And the her foster family is um, like, ooh, yeah, this is great. We can, it, he'll give us rights and we'll be able to smuggle without problem. Ooh, this is such a good match. And she's like, I do not want to get married. I do not want to get married. I do not want to get married. I don't want a man to touch me. Um, and it's very interesting because I'm not, I'm not fully sure why she is so against, and not that you have to have a reason for not wanting to get married, but, uh, it, I would have liked if there was like if if we got a moment where she looked at the her foster parents and saw um, how abusive it was. But the, the thing is, from what she saw, the woman had was wearing the pants in this relationship. She hopped her husband up on opium and she ran the business, you know, not that she was a nice lady, but like she she was definitely in charge. She popped out one kid for the guy and then she like she was done. Um and, but she has such a visceral... It's one of those things where, like, we've read so many books now where the character has a reaction that's so not necessarily anachronistic because you can just not want to marry a merchant. Mm -hmm. But kind of like in um, the Snow White retelling that I don't remember the name of, uh, Forest of a Thousand Lanterns, it's like, why? It might be more interesting if the character had a little bit more of a mercenary view of marriage. Like, okay, this guy's fat which i don't know again uh and and unlikable and old but like you know what he's gonna die soon and i get to be his widow you know what i mean i'll put up with this a little bit whatever like this is actually not terrible again not that in especially in this book she has to have that view which is anachronistic for her not to want to marry somebody but it might have been a little bit more interesting, interesting if it was a to see it that way want. especially because her foster mother tells her like listen you get him addicted to opium. Give it to him little by little. <laughs> Which was a great plan. You you pop out a kid. Once he has an heir, you're done. You you And once he's fully hopped up on opium, you rule. It's your house. My girl, I am giving you. And again, I don't like this lady. She was very, this is 100% not me endorsing. But like, she, she basically says, marriage does suck, but here's a way you can spin it and you can be queen of the castle. Um, And she's like, nope I, i'm not gonna do that so her way to get out of this is a long shot and when i say it's a long shot it's it, it's a long shot and it doesn't feel as long of a shot as it should feel um she has been on the side sometimes going to this tutor guy who helps train kids to pass the kuju um and uh she uh she goes to him and is like listen i don't want to get married train me to pass it I need to pass it and then I can get out of here. And he's like, people study for like ever for this. You got two years to try pass this. And she's like, I can memorize books by sheer force of will. And I didn't love this because she's able to memorize just like a book a week. 
um, and then still have the old stuff in her head. But like, unless you have a photographic memory, which her friend Kitai has, you'd have to be consistently revisiting and making sure like you would, you would have to be like thinking of the books and going over them again. And again. as someone who professionally deals with tutors and teaching kids to pass the LSTAT and SAT and whatever other things are analogous to the Kuju, do you feel like this is a realistic way that she could pass it, Maria, in your professional opinion? Uh, no, like, especially because she regularly says she doesn't understand. And, and here's the thing, if it is purely, here's a quote, complete it, then yeah, you can me memorize that. But how much space do you have in your head? Because she ends up memorizing so many books and I'm, i don't know why the main why the author didn't just give her uh, a photographic, a photographic. that would have made it made sense and then so um silken layan says the way rin had such a strong reaction to marriage actually gave me ace sex repulsive vibes but again that was not developed enough i actually think that, that would have been would really be awesome. interesting yeah if that, that would have been, been so cool yeah like that would have made a lot more sense where like you know let me put this off the screen so you can see our lovely faces, or at least Maria's lovely face and my, I'm way too early in the morning face. Um, that would have been really interesting if like she had just thought even before that, like, I don't get what people are talking about all the time. That kind of grosses me out a little bit. You know, that's not a thing I'm interested in. Um, that would have made a lot more sense. And it also would have been nice if she like, because there's points where she like looks at Alton and she's like, Wow, he's really pretty. But if 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 it would have been explicitly couched in a like he's really pretty, but I I don't really want to touch him outside of like a good hug. And not again that it had to be explicit, but I think that would have been a really cool way to like couch her repulsiveness. Um because a, a huge thing that she does anytime stuff gets hard, she like chants to herself, uh he sees you coming down the aisle. He licks his lips. He takes you to and I was like, "Girl, this is traumatic." Um Anyway, so yeah. she throws herself. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, another motivation. Maybe she has been um, assaulted earlier, and this is a, a recurring trauma, for example. Or even if it had been something where we got a scene where she interacted with him and just did not like him as a person. Like, that's the thing is, like, this is a small town. Theoretically, she should have actually interacted with him and yeah. known. And then that would have provided a stronger basis. Like, but that's one of the things is about this book is I that not like it. A lot of times this book spends so much time on shit that doesn't matter and then doesn't really build up the concreteness to certain of its major motivations. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Ali Snow says uh, underdeveloped fuzzy Rin motivation. <laughs> number one. All right. <coughs> Sorry, I choked on my spit. Um. Anyway. Miss <laughs> um, Ali Snow, we're going to depend on you to keep num count of how many fuzzy underdeveloped fuzzy motivations, motivations there are. You're anyway, deputized. So she completely throws herself into uh, studying and she's able to still do her job, do heckin' studies, uh, go in, memorizing all these books. She takes the uh, koju and she passes. And the other thing that she realized is not only did she have to pass the koju, like it wasn't enough to just do well on it. She had to do so well that she would get into the one academy that was free, which is the military academy that creates generals for the army. Um, so she has to be like super extra good. And she does it. Yay! Woohoo! Like she and I didn't she uses pain a lot as a motivator when she gets really tired and she can't stay awake. Um, her teacher, her tutor is like, listen. He, he tells her a story where the moral of it is like, you got to sleep at some point, like, and you're almost done. Don't worry about it. And um, she, she's like, oh, I'll use pain to keep me awake and I'll burn myself every time I'm getting sleepy. The thing is, that's not sustainable. That is how you do shitty on a test. And I can speak to this from someone who, like Will said, my literal mm -hmm. job is making sure kids are either like either because they're below level getting to level or uh, exam prep for a specific test do well and one of the things I have to remind people all the time is that if you do not give yourself time to sleep if you do not give yourself time to rest you are not going to do well you're going to do worse I mean in general that whole like I can focus and do this that is just not an effective way to learn anything or remember anything and so the fact that she passes with like normally I would be like okay the author isn't necessarily saying you should study like this you know, it's a character flaw that she thinks this in this rural town. Um, but then she does pass it, which is weird and does not it's make a, a lot of sense. It's a 12-hour test. She basically confesses that she's not eating. She's 
barely sleeping. I do not recommend. <laughs> Marika said, you don't recommend the burning candle method to your students? No, I do not. I, I would highly recommend against. Um, but yeah, and it's a 12 hour test. You haven't been sleeping properly. You haven't been eating. I have had kids go in and fail the test because they had a bad night of sleep and they didn't eat breakfast in the morning. And she's going to go in and that's a three hour test, like four and a half hours if you have extra time. And and you're going to go in and pass like a 12 hour test like that. Like, it's just. That's, that's not how brains work. And, I mean, I, maybe somebody's done it. Maybe somebody's going to comment like, I did that for my ACT and I got a 35. Where Where's your, like, okay, that's fine. But like sleep is important. And I, I don't think her life doesn't sound sustainable. I don't think she would have done that well, especially like your memory being a tied to your brain function. And if you're not sleeping and giving your brain a chance, and it's not like she's taking like performance enhancing drugs that give her like, like she's not popping ca caffeine pills to like do this. If you're denying your body sleep, how are you? Anyway, anyway, I'm going to step down off of that. <laughs> That's a weird high horse to get on. I understand. I will get off. She passes the kudju, and now she has to go to the capital city because she is from the south. Uh, farmland, the rest of the country doesn't really respect him that much. Um, so now she has to go to the capital. It's, it's ooh, city i, city I did like how mm. this was handled in that she goes there and she hates it and i thought that was pretty f it was a great way of showing the culture shock um and also it helps ground her as a character because you do get a sense that like oh this isn't just a modern character transplanted into this world who's seen cities and stuff like that this is a rural character who just does not know that buildings can have second stories and stuff like that yep. and personally it made me empathize um with the character because i lived in new york for a couple weeks while I was um, helping take care of my nephew. And God, is that city a roach's nest. I'm sorry, any New Yorkers we have in our audience. I hate that city. It's so cramped and dirty and loud, and I don't like it. You can you, unsubscribe. The, sub, the suburbs of Florida? <laughs> I did Peak go to... Living. I did go to Philadelphia afterward and it was so gorgeous. I had never quite understood how important visually your environment is in making you feel a, little, a certain way. Cause I then came back to South Florida and everything was just tan and hot and I didn't like it. But this is all beside the point. She goes to the city to join this academy. She immediately gets bullied by a guy called. Oh, 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 oh my uh, God. I don't remember. Guys, what was his name? The, the... Korean bad boy. Um, uh, oh, what is ne his name? Neji? Ne 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 oh, God. It's ne remember. Guys, help us out in the chat. You're three. You're like five seconds behind. But anyway, by this like high Draco Neja? Malfoy. Neja? Neja, maybe. It was, basically, she gets Nesh. Neja. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and um, my and baby. <laughs> yeah. My baby. Too, Neja. Um, and he's like, hey, this is a pee pee pee. Like, it just it's classic. <laughs> well, I'll do that again while you're in, in your full screen. Uh, I can't. Like, it was a thing. <laughs> I can't just repeat it. You, listen, <laughs> if you're missing the gold, Will, you're missing the gold. I can't help you. <laughs> I can't edit it back in. Okay, you go can't. ahead. Anyway, um, and uh, immediately he's like, uh, you Southerner, you you like rural brat. You you, I bet you didn't even actually pass it. Mur, mur, mur. You're just here because they had to bring someone from the South. Like classic, a cat. Like, and the thing is, I could have really liked because I've watched so many Korean dramas, animes, mangas. Like I read so much like high school setting, uh, like sports, like stuff, manga. Uh, when I was younger, like I could have been, uh, yeah, I totally call <laughs> Ali says, um, I totally call him Draco Malfoy in my head while reading you mud blood. That is a hundred, a hundred percent. It anyway. Um, and I could have really enjoyed that. The problem is this isn't the point of the book. She's at this Academy. She needs to do well. She needs to prove herself, tap into like inner things and stuff like that. That's not the point of this book at all. So like, <laughs> There's stuff that happens that I have to talk about, but it is so inconsequential. Her being a southerner and like dark skinned and stuff is like a big part of this first dark in the book. And it makes no sense. It, it, it doesn't add anything. It feels like the author was just like, oh, this is a thing I know will happen um, or happens in terms of oppression. But it's not like I'm going to make a, a comparison here to Maria's favorite book. You're welcome. Spinning Silver. 
where in that book, after she defeats the big bad, Miriam is like, I don't want to go back to being a marginalized person, you know, a Jewish person in this society where they don't love me. So I'm going to go off and marry the, um, what's his name? Star. Star the Star King. Star um, Starry, the Starry Eyed King. Um, and, uh, like that kind of makes sense as like, oh, OK, she did this thing, but she doesn't want to go back in this book. It's not like suddenly um, she, you know, Rin is like, OK, maybe the Mugen have a point or maybe, you know, I don't want it. Why do I want to save all these people if they hate me? It's kind of just then forgotten um, yeah. afterwards. So it, it feels a little uh, this is one of the things about the book feeling muddled is it doesn't really go anywhere. And because her being a oh, being oh, coming in clutch. Merrick von der Mehedin, underdeveloped fuzzy Marin motivation number two. Yes. Um, because again, she she does that thing where, um, and I've talked about this before, where the character is like, I need to do this thing. I need to play it cool so people don't like, <laughs> notice me. And yeah. so Marika pointed out, Rin, I will do anything not to get married. This is the most important thing in my life. Also, Rin, somebody says something bad about her, clocks them. Like, just immediately, like, <laughs> day one, she punches Neja for insulting her tutor. And like, girl, you just got here. You are smarter than this. What are we doing? Impulse control. Anyway, um, so she gets to school. There's classes. Everyone else there comes from some sort of, like, money, socioeconomic privilege. Uh, and, um, you know, and she's just that one, like, poor village bumpkin that happens to be here. Um, and so she deals with a lot of, like, hate towards that. Oh, and this was something I was going to say her upbringing as village bumpkin dark skin because she spent a lot of time in the sun as a southerner is completely going to change in a way that if this was multiple books would work because you could just have this book be about her being a southerner and uns unsophisticated and then later when it gets recontextualized it's in a separate book but it's going to get recontextualized in this book and all of this like like she's not dark skinned because she was in the sun and she was like, had to work for a living. She would have always been dark skinned, even if she had been in the side for it. Like, um, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Way, I want to just bring this up uh, because I still think it's funny. Um, Miss Allie Snow said, Oh, you should see how Maria uh, pronounced my username the first time. Uh, Ms. Allie Snow, as uh, she did it. It was yeah. no, it was like Melissa. I Snow. was saying, like, I started oh, yeah, saying you were. Melissa, and then suddenly was like, what am I doing? Like, what is this? It was like <laughs> Melissa Snow, and it was it was just real weird. I'm so sorry, Allie. To this, I think about that all the time. The fact that it. By the way, guys, if you want me to pronounce your name correctly, um, in the Discord before, right before we're gonna go live, put out phonetically what your name is, and I'll try to do it correctly. I like. I'm not. I don't usually care too much about pronouncing people's names right, but I will give it a shot because you are our patrons you and you give us money. Yes. Um. Anyway, so she gets there. She goes to class. She makes friends with this guy named Kitai. He is like. Uh, he grew up with a bunch of other people in the capital, and um, he's a very stock character of like jokey joke, joke, not actually funny joke, joke. I don't <sighs> think of him as like that at all. I thought of him as the nerd, like the know it all nerd with a photographic memory. Um, so uh, but I he makes not... so many jokes that are not funny. But I see, I don't remember him being jokey. I, I just I, remember I him have being, a much like... lower tolerance for it than you do in general. So that Kitai kind of Ron sense. Weasley, hysterical. <laughs> that is exact. Oh God, it's Harry Potter. <laughs> By the way, uh, here I we go. Kitai so, <clears throat> Marieke van der Mierheiden said, "Pronounce it even worse next time." You got it. I provide the goods for you guys. Hysterical. It, it, it is. It's uh, Ron. Uh, Kitai is Ron plus uh, Hermione in this setting. Anyway, uh, her and Kitai become friends because they're both kind of outsiders. Kitai is not very like uh, athletic. He's the uh, rich people can be okay character. Yeah. That's, that's very much his function in the book. That's really it. Um, <laughs> and what you learn is that the school has multiple tracks. You can be like str strategy track. You can be medicine track. You can be combat track. You can be, I don't know, stargazing track. Whatever the case is. You can go into potions if there was such a thing and this was hard. <laughs> um, and what happens is your first year you study, you take lessons and everything. And then at the end of it, you have to take exams. And then there is like a combat competition. And then... 
one of the masters, there's like six of them, will then be like, I would now like you to be uh, an apprentice of mine and, and you shall be one of my peeps. And if nobody asks you to be their apprentice, you get kicked out. So she's like, oh shit, I had a four year plan. I was going to come here. I was going to be good for four years. And now in one, I could be fucked. Kitai and Nadja are related, right? No, I thought they were like their fathers work together. Like, uh, uh, yeah, no, I think Nadja's, it's just like they're connected through. Um, Nadja's dad ties. is the the dragon warlord, and then uh, Kitai's dad is like his advisor person. <laughs> <laughs> the exam, the exam system gave me the voice vibes. Um, you know that actually would have been better. That would have been funny. But so the the main important part about this period is that like there's one teacher who f teaches combat and is like uh he is dumb and, and and anachronistic and it's you know also i'm racist and you rin can't learn fighting anymore not, and then there's... not racist he's uh he he looks down upon people of lower classes it's a socioeconomic uh, oh prejudice. okay oh uh, yeah no um that's the same thing um and then uh and then there's like who is that teacher in the name of the wind <laughs> Um, he's a oh, very oh the, the the one who teaches him the name of the wind and pushes him off the the yeah, at the building. It is God, exactly the character. Um, it's he's just dumb. very like in the. He's like a sage. He's like quirky and makes a lot of fart jokes. And is like, oh, I uh, he's on the the lore track is what it is. And Logan was like, what does that even mean? Lindbergh coming in. Clutch. Yeah, clutch. Loden was the the guy from the. Name there we go. Proof on screen. Um. And and so um, my and favorite like, thing in that book was Elodin pushing. What's his I face don't think it's him. that. I think he he falls off the the roof and Elodin. Oh, he tells like, him to jump. Oh yeah, like it's. And anyway. Elodin is like, why did you do that? <laughs> I was kidding. Um, I love it. These, yeah. So basically, and like no one takes him seriously, but she tries to start learning martial arts from a book because she can't actually go to the but, martial arts class. Yeah. And um and it then one day. Yeah. Jiang finds her and is like, what the hell are you doing? This makes no sense. I'll teach you martial arts. Quirky joke, weird, something, something, something. Fart noises. And he, again, <laughs> yeah. his track is lore, which is like history of the gods, uh, mythology. And everybody's like, why the fuck do we need that at a fucking military college? And this guy's like, he's, he's never shown up for class once. Like there's a lore class. They keep showing up. He's never there. Um, so he's like, I'm going to, you're footwork is good but you have no training uh, and you're not strong i'll train you but i'm gonna do it my way and his way is not fully explaining things making her do stuff <laughs> and then eventually things click into place um so one of the things he does which was hysterical is he makes her go to like a butcher in the city synagogue um and it, it, she has to carry a piglet up a mountain and let him drink from a particular spring until he's gonna get butchered so eventually she's carrying a giant ass uh piggy up the mountain, uh, which causes her to get strong and deals with her fundamental, just like, you are a shopkeeper, girl. Like, you ain't got no muscle, hunty. Uh, and then he trains her. They do animal forms. There's a lot of, like, he brings the lore into things. Um, and then this thing happens where he's like, I'd like you to do lore track. I'd like to train you. You've got some power. I think this could be good. And she's like, no, I want to go into strategy. <laughs> I just needed to learn how to fight. And he's like, mm. so then he avoids her. You missed up an important part, which is that at this point, he learns that she can do magic powers. And she learns that he can do magic powers. No, no, no. Yep. No. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not until after she does the fight with Nedja that, that he learns that. Yeah, but they is... don't make the big split about um, him avoiding her because she won't do. No, um, no, no. It's at this point because. No, no, no. It's here. There's there's two points where he avoids Patrons, her. No. back me up in the comments no. below. I'm, I'm the one who gets to ban correct. people. Um, so I'm just bear that in mind. 100% correct. Anyway, okay, go ahead. so she's like, I want to do strategy. And he was like, you know, that's a waste. And then he's like, well, I'm not going to continue to train you. So she goes back to doing her thing. She studies up. See? Maria is right. Ha ha. Ha ha. This is my revenge. Victory. Victory. Pistolas. Victory. Uh, you don't need pistolas. At... I'm right. <laughs> um see will you're wrong okay bro. all right all right okay <laughs> guys all right. it's so good when you're here you know a lot of the time there we I'm go alone, that's better sad defending uh 
he probably know, knew she had powers. Yes, I agree with that, Amanda, that he probably didn't know she had powers. You don't realize, but you're not on I do! I know I'm not! <laughs> I mean, just ignore it and continue talking. Fuck All you. Right, I ahead. don't need to be physically on the screen. <laughs> My presence is powerful enough. Fuck you. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, um... <laughs> So, uh, by the way, this is something I would normally cut out of the video, guys. Uh, not because I'm afraid of being wrong, but just because I, I've noticed people tend to dismiss criticism if you get basic certain factual information wrong, and I find that very annoying. Um, but I uh, don't worry, I understand my memory is not the best when it comes to books. Okay, go ahead. Um, anyway, and then like the tournament happens, and she's like, I'm gonna do strategy. She studies really hard at the beginning, she's not that great back at oh, I forgot, she gets rid of her uterus. Like she doesn't get rid of it, but she like scorched no. earth her yeah. uterus. She gets her period. She doesn't know what it is. She thinks she's dying. Uh, you know, at Which, first I thought it was fair. magic. Is like she'd done this thing, and then her like she felt pains in her core, and I was like, oh no, it's just period cramps. It's not. It's not magic. It's and just... this is not one of those minor ones. She has like intense cramps and pain. Um, and then yeah, she is like, I'm gonna she get rid of my uterus, dying. which. She is so lucky that went correctly. Normally, even in the modern age with like antibiotics, that does not always go as well as you would think, and especially yeah. in a pre-industrialized medicine. And the yeah. reason she does it is her period is so bad, she can't go to school. And anytime uh, she uh, anytime she has to like uh, miss class, she's missing a ton of stuff and her teachers have no sympathy for it. And so she's like, this is going to happen every month. How am I going to do it? And the other girls were like, you just take this pad and you string it up in between your leggies and you'll be fine. And she's like, I am dying. I'm in pain, like potentially endometriosis levels of pain. Um, <clears throat> and so then they're like, she's like, can I not do this like because this is a week of every month i'll never catch up if i have to be out a week of every month um and so the one girl is like well you can get rid of it but you know if you want kids down the line then you can't undo it and she's like that sounds great i don't ever plan on having <laughs> it we're gonna get rid of it and she has to like drink a potion and it again scorched earth um yeah it <laughs> So okay, I, I'm loving some of the comments. This too, uh, uh, in the tradition of me pronouncing words worth, Silky uh, uh says she had her period just once. Calm down, girl. Talk to a grown up, please. Yeah, that's the thing is she decides to nuke it midway through the first one, and it's like, okay, maybe chill a little bit. Also, it's one of these things where, like, I get she was a rural person, but like, she would know about this. She wasn't sheltered, like. People who live on farms and in a rural setting, she doesn't live on a farm, she lives in a shop. They tend to know about these things. People make jokes about it. It's really more of like a post-Christianity society where you would not. It, it, she would know about periods. Like, that's all I'm saying. But, but, <laughs> and uh, then, Amanda, uh, Amanda has a great... Wait, no, no. Oh. Uh, Miss Alexander said, having periods suck, gonna eat this, uh, uh, eat this mf -er. uh, um, And then Amanda says, something makes her upset. Just get rid of it. I don't know why y'all are talking about uh, she she's, is consistent. she's consistent. Yes, she is. She's um, so lucky this went correctly. And then the doctor is like, oh, yeah, you guys should all do this. Um, also, Lindbergh said, uh, I'm still I'm still angry. Don't know what she takes to nuke her uterus. She it's magic. I, like it's a not actually magic in the book, but like it's not a real thing. I'm pretty sure because there's no thing in real life where you can take it. And this is going to end well in a pre-industrialized nation. Yeah. Anyway, so she does that. It's back to where I was. That happened previously. <laughs> um and, and she ends up being like oh maybe that wasn't the bestest decision uh mm, uh yeah <laughs> underdeveloped fuzzy motivation um so she does the competition and at this point she is besides sparring with jong uh crazy fart noise lore teacher she's never <laughs> actually fought with anyone before and there's this guy at school his name is alton he's at this point uh he's gonna graduate this year um and he is the most excellent the most handsome the most amazing fighter guy at like he is literally living legend legend status it's like if you go to school with a celebrity kind of vibes all the girls have crushes on him kitai has like a, a guy crush on him and um it, and that is because he is a spearling, which is where we need to talk about this. The spearlings, which I He's hate the, the name. First genocide. <laughs> is genocide number one, which is that they were on this island and they were these group of firebenders who like were part of the Nikon military and were super terrible and after and, like, after like strong. 
in the first Poppy War, they were brought into the Nikon as military force, but prior to that, they'd been an independent nation. Right. And so, like, they, again, are firebenders that can do super cool things, even though nobody believes in magic now, whatever. Um, and then in the second Poppy War, uh, Mugen, ge like, genocided their whole island, and Alton is the last one. Yes. Uh, and he's so efficient. He's like a panther. He just, and he's so calm when he does the fightings, just like, ooh. So good, so so badass, um, and really quiet. Like you don't get much of his personality other than like the idealized version that Rin and everybody else thinks about him. So broody, so broody, um, and I uh, everybody's like super impressed with his fighting. And Rin has never actually fought with anyone. And she, during the like competition leading up to exams or after exams she does fine on her exams you know she memorized things she learned stuff she was good um and she they do it tournament style where like you pair off with someone whoever wins goes on to the next stage and to the next stage and to the next stage and then it's just her and Neja. and her some people are like don't fight him he's gonna fuck you up because Neja regularly um you're not supposed to actively name someone during the fighting you're just supposed to incapacitate them or get them to yield and he is at like he fucked up someone in uh his previous bout to the point where like they might be crippled at this point like like he he, he really hurt them and um which just really like the fact that he gets a the arc he does after <laughs> is interesting to other people and like i love him i love the later development of his character but it's choices like this that i wish would have been like like it was an accident that he hurt people like it, the fact that it is portrayed as him in intentionally fucking up other people for his place is just a weird one anyway um and she's like no i'm gonna fight him everybody has been blown away by my fights i've been fucking people up left and right she's doing amazing she's just flowing in wah, 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 you know doing great um and so her and Nedja fight, and it gets to the point where, like, it's it's getting really heightened, and she's getting angry, and she's like, I'm gonna fuck him up. And she starts, like, almost killing him. Like, people have to, because, like, when he was fucking people up, you know, that was okay, because he's, like, the dragon lord's, uh, the dragon warlord's son and a guy, I guess. But then when she's, like, almost gonna kill him, people are ripping her off, and she's suddenly alive with heat. Like, she's on fire internally, and she feels this power, this energy in her, and she's like, I need to get this out of me. I am dying. Am I dying? What is this? And so she, like, runs, and she ends up in the garden that her and Jong were always at, and he's there, and he's like, oh, shit. Yeah, that's not good. So he says some words. He touches her. His touch is very cool, and it dispels all the energy from her, and he's like, oh, yeah, you are a danger to yourself and those around you. You need to pledge lore and she's like i do i need to figure out how to control this and he's like you need to figure out how to balance this and keep it from happening and so you're brought up to because here's some motivations that have been shaky so she started this whole journey for i need to not get married okay that was her motivation to join the kudju uh, to take the kudju pass it and she needed to be able to take care of herself for the four years so she needed to get into the military academy at synagard uh because she needed like she couldn't pay tuition anywhere else so she didn't want at no point did she want to be a military leader it's not like her goal growing up listening to the stories of the poppy war had been uh you know don't like i want to be a military leader and avenge things you know that wasn't it at all at all um and then she gets to school and she's like i need to do well enough that i can be here the next year um and then uh so that's that's motivation too um Hold on, hold on, guys. I'm adding fancy banners to this. Oh, there we go. Fancy banners. Um, and so she needs to stay here and, and get uh, committed. And originally she wants to go into strategy because, like, her, she likes the thought process and she's good at it. I feel a little ruthless. Um, and then now it's like, ooh, there is power. I tapped into some power and I want the power. And there is a difference between what Jong is trying to teach her and what she wants out of it which is she wants to be able to tap into whatever that power is and use it. And he is like, no, no, no. I'm just going to teach you how to keep that burning thing from happening and how to balance yourself. Um, but how we jumped for from, I don't want to get married to, I want access to this power, baby. I don't buy it. No, it is an odd, again, it's like I said earlier, there is a weird thing where like, while we weren't paying attention, there was a link between these two things, but in the book itself, there is not actually a link. 
um, I, I guess you could interpolate um, that it's because she's been in this environment where did Maria disappeared, guys. I'm, I'm the only one who cares. Laptop, keep going. I'm the only one who cares about this podcast. It's okay. Um, it's hard. I just keep her around. Oh, underdeveloped, fuzzy, written motivation number four. All right, cool. Um, yeah, it's like there's a jump in her motivations when we weren't paying attention. Um, and like, I didn't actually notice it at first, but it is weird. And especially if we're going by what the author said in terms of this being the point of this book being an examination of how you go from rural peasant to dictator a la Mao Zedong. Um, this is a weird way to do it. You would think you would pay more attention. It reminded me of um, Forest of a Thousand Lanterns where like, it, it, well, actually, yes and no, because it's actually a little bit clearer in a Forest of a Thousand, Thousand Lanterns. It's just also not good because it's this whole destiny fate thing where like, but again, you have an issue where the motivations don't, connect clearly from one to the next um I, I don't know why it's a problem in in the asian fantasies we've read but yeah uh max uh said the author's hand like the author knows where the story wants to go but the characters don't want to i don't necessarily think it's that they don't want to it's that we're not given a good enough reason why they get there because the jump from i don't want to get married to i want power that is a weird jump. Now, if it was, I don't want to be married because I don't want to be under someone else's power. I want to be the one who's always in control. And 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 thus in steady degrees, like, okay, if I want to go to Synagogue, I like, what master can I be the most in control? You know, Jung makes his uh, apprentices kind of puppets to him but this master lets you do your own thing and explore stuff and that's why she had wanted to do strategy and so that there was a, a theme that's kind of but that's not it it's it's it, like again even in the first part of her being at uh Synagard, she's like i see I'm, I'm walking down the aisle he's licking his lips and again it's still that like anti-marriage thing so it's just a really weird jump and we're gonna make <laughs> several more weird jobs. we go from i don't want to get married to i want to genocide an entire group of people uh you know that, that that's the the big jump of this book and we got a couple other smaller ones to get there um anyway actually so it reminds me because um yesterday day before yesterday me and maria um recorded uh the golden enclaves an excellent book all of you should read oh, and that man. is a book where guys I, I wish we were talking about that and that's a book where I kind of complained about how the characters, beside it being a great book, it, the character spends a lot of time thinking about her motivations and like, this means this and that means that and this. And like, I'd also talked previously in um, Harrow, the, uh, Harrow the Ninth and also No No the Ninth, yes, that video is coming, um, about how the characters don't do that enough. So there's a balance between the two, but like, this is such a long book. There should have been more of that from the character meditating on what they want and like the the connection between these two things. Um, one of the things I actually really like, take a shot, is Ooh. in A Song of Ice and Fire in the second yes. book where there's a character, Theon, who does some like terrible stuff. Um, and it's funny because you can see him once he does a terrible thing, retroactively trying to make sense of it in a way where he's like, he said the thing and then that felt true in his gut. And that also makes sense because he's just a Weasley character. At one point he's like, says like, oh, I did it as revenge for my brothers. And it's like, no, you didn't. You weren't thinking that when you did this terrible thing. And so people, and that's a very, very, very common thing. Your brain in general works very hard to try to convince you you're one person. So it automatically whitewashes a lot of your past thoughts to try to make them um, match what's going on currently in, in your motivations. But like, I felt like more of that would have been good. It really just needed more of her thinking about stuff, even though this book spends way too long. Anyway, we're spending too long on this. Uh, this I know, I know we're, we're at an hour and four minutes and like, I have to be like, I have to end this at 12 because I work at one o'clock. So I need to like finish. Actually, Doesn't no, I, we can, go, we can go until 1230 because I'm wearing my work clothes. So as long as I have time to like pack my lunch. <laughs> uh, anyway. Says, I'm at work, can't take a shot. Or can I? Oh, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho. Can you? Um, anyway, so she passes. She commits lore because uh, Jung, uh, Jung and the strategy guy, she picks lore, obviously, because now she knows that shamanism is real because everybody's like, oh, the Spearleys couldn't do fire magic. That's a myth. And then Jung is like, no, 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 they could. It, that, that was a thing. And she trains with Jung and she kind of learns to 
uh, like center herself. She has to meditate. She's not a character who meditating comes natural to. And there, this, there's a lot of telling in this section. And it's weird because the stuff that is scenes are not the important ones. So you focus on her, like you get a couple scenes of her failing to meditate and him yelling at her or like scolding her about it. But then when she actually does meditate, that could have been a really cool scene, figuring out how does she actually get to that space? How does she actually calm herself, think of nothing and sit? That's so against her character. We never get to see that scene. She's like, and then I was able to do it for one hour. And then I did it for two hours. And then he made me do it for five hours. Like, okay, you built that up. We don't get the payout of seeing it. There's one of those things I complained in um, Mask of Mirrors that like things are set up and we want the catharsis of seeing the thing play out. And then it just very quickly is summarized. Um, that happens here. Oh my God, so much. Anyway, and eventually he's like, I'm going to let you go into the Pantheon. And what it, the idea is, is that she can militarily go into the Pantheon of the gods. So Miss Ali Snow says, other military people, the Spearleys couldn't really do magic. That silly Spearleys have a whole military unit that does magic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how, I don't, and I don't know why, what benefit is it to pretend that shamanism doesn't exist? I don't understand that whole part of this either in terms of like it being, I don't get, yeah, I don't get the, the, uh, the entire, the like, author tries to make an argument that, that out of the history, like what benefit is that? Like if, especially at a military academy, would you not want to account for that? And especially since you know that other people can still do this. Yeah. It felt like an, an underdeveloped part of the book. Again, it's one of the ways the book is muddy in terms of just having too much going on. One of the big um, themes about shamanism that we're going to talk about, um, and, well, we're not, we're going to talk about, but it's going to become a big thing in the book is that Zhang is of the mind that like, you shouldn't fall too much into it and you shouldn't use it for destructive measures. It's more about like understanding and transcending and um, people who use shamanism too much go crazy and become an avatar of a God and like, go increasingly insane and have to be locked up, which is a, a twist later in the book, but we'll get to that when we get to yeah. that. So that's one of the big conflicts, but also, and like, I get that as a conflict that power brings madness and what are you willing to pay? Or, Lindbergh's comment. It's great. Click. Yeah. And how do you pay off every single person alive 20 years ago who saw the trifecta to say now that 100% shamanism isn't real? It's odd. <clears throat> There's also a vague sort of conflict between in, modernism and non-modernism and that he says that the reason that shamanism is no longer around is that it's not mass producible which seems like it would be a really interesting contrast to explore but it isn't explored really within the book it's not like a cultural conflict um it's an under again an underdeveloped story element anyway so um and Jong is like, here, I'm going to give you, here are some psychedelics you can pick from. You're going to use these psychedelics to help your mind get to the pantheon where all the gods are. Um, and she's like, okay, she takes some poppy seeds. She like munches on those, goes up a mountain and chills. And then she goes into the pantheon and she sees it's like a circle place. And there's a bunch of uh, plinths with like God symbols on them. And as she's going up, there's a woman. Uh, a dark-skinned woman. Uh, a thing to mention that we didn't say before, the Spearleys, the, the people that Alton is from, they are all dark-skinned. Um, and so there's this dark-skinned woman and she's like, don't do this. Do not talk to the Phoenix. It's bad news. You will not, like, it takes more than it's willing to give. Don't do it, my girl. Um, and I... Then she comes back down and she goes to him and she was like, I did it. I connected to the Pantheon. Okay, how do I use the power? And he was like, no, 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 no. I was just, next time you feel yourself all overheated because of anger, because you let yourself get too heated about something, you go there, you find the God of the, the opposite thing, and you use that to calm yourself down. I'm teaching you balance. And while this is happening, a war breaks out. There was this whole thing where, like, the old Muganese emperor died. His one uh, son came into power. The one son is, like, hella, like, not great. But there was also this weird thing where, like, you get a scene. And so you heard about this group of people called the Psyche. Uh, and the Psyche were the queen's assassins. Okay. I, was I the only one who kept waiting to go, Psyche? Like, yeah. P-S-Y-C-K? Yeah, you, you were... You were I was the only one? Okay, yeah. all right. I kept thinking there was going to be a joke about that, and then there wasn't, and I was disappointed. It would have been a great pun. Okay, Go ahead. anyway. Um, and what you learn is that the psych is actually a unit of uh, shamans 
of different powers who the queen uses to uh oh god i forgot about to explain who the fuck the trifecta <laughs> is. oh my god really quick the trifecta once upon a time before the poppy wars when the the nation had to be united there was like the the dragon king who was given powers there was this lady named the serpent serp not the serpent the yeah this, the viper the viper uh she had like powers and she was real pretty and then there was the gatekeeper uh who was like thank you star. mariaka i appreciate being validated <laughs> she did say psych to the six um anyway um and then there was the gate who like wasn't strong like super but he was a scholar but he was given the ability to op open a portal into like the other realm and bring in beasts and together the three of them united uh nikon and uh saved everyone huzzah and everybody's like i wonder if they're still around uh, blah, blah, blah. uh eventually you find out the queen is the vi the viper lady she's she's that she can mind control people she ends up killing her current guard of the psych and and she kind of this was a little fuzzy this was one of those things where like when will said sometimes things were described and i wasn't exactly sure what's happening did she start the war it seems like this is a um because like they were in the ashes situation where like there's deeper things going on with the gods trying to take control through their human puppets because it seems like yeah she and the emperor are like in cahoots to start the war but like that's all you learn about it it's it's odd and muddled um and basically seems like it was just set there to set up a sequel um yeah. and didn't necessarily fit this book Anyway, I'm going to go past that. But um, so the war breaks out. The Muganese are invading. Now everyone who's in school is now roped into the actual military. Um, and uh, there's they're going to attack Synagard. And she's like, Jong, we need to use these powers. Teach me how to access the Phoenix's power so I can use it for war. And he's like, no, no, no. The God's gifts do not come without a price. We do not use them for destruction, my girl. Have I taught you nothing? And apparently you have. You have taught her nothing. She does not understand <laughs> at all. Um, and so he kind of goes off and does his own thing. The Muganese invade. She, like, is fighting. She's terrified. Things go well. Eventually her and Neja, um uh end up in a point all like they it's, i love this scene in the sense that i love like like uh amanda i kind i love Neja, but at the same time how we got to this point is very abrupt okay so this part of it i actually thought was very organic and made sense it's the part mm -hmm. after this that i don't think it makes so much sense basically they're fighting the mugen it's going real bad um Neja saves her at one point and then they fight back to back because even though they were rivals they work together now that there's um japanese around but then suddenly a Sekiro boss shows up and it's a really big, Sekiro is a video game, Maria. Um, okay, and Sekiro boss that, shows up it. and is like, okay, oh, I'm gonna kill all you guys. And then Jiang shows up and does exactly the opposite of what he's been saying this whole time and summons a bunch of Asian monsters. You, you discover um, in this moment, he's the gatekeeper. He opens the portal, the monsters come through. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, it burns everybody down except for the Sekiro boss, who now is in uh, stage two of the boss. And he goes up and he stabs Neje, and we think he's dead, but he's not. Spoiler alert. Um, and then he goes to fight Rin, but Rin unlocks her uh, fire Phoenix bending powers. Yeah, her fire she... bending powers, and just like blows everything up. Yeah um so intensely and then like the queen's there and she's like ah yes we should assign her to the side the queen the viper lady who's a shaman uh kisses her and helps her calm down in the fire uh come and yeah. she's fine now um and then <laughs> the everybody like, uh, kisses her forehead and and uh Oh, God damn it. I messed that up. Keep going. Yeah, you did. And also, it's Shut the opposite. Up. It's a queen Shut who kissed up. her for it. Oh, and you're right. That would have been better. It's the opposite. She she doused it. How to turn someone off. Look, I'm the one who has to make these references. Go ahead. Yeah. Anyway. um, And so she's like locked up for a bit. Everybody's like, oh, she's too powerful. What can we do? And eventually, like, she's assigned to the psych. And they're like, congratulations. We think you're also a spearly. We don't know how we lost track of you. But we think you're a spearly. <laughs> um uh and you're going to and uh we need the psych and the psych are big tough ape guy we have grumpy boar guy we have cute kid who can blow stuff up with bombs who isn't we a shaman who isn't a shaman but maybe is 40 years old and bow lady with a hawk and um a water guy 
Yeah. <laughs> Who seems um, like a Hellboy character. But it's like, I, I get it. It You get the cool squad of people. I just felt it was a little forced and like they were a little bit cringe. But it's, I, I can understand why people are, are like it. But basically now Alton is the one in charge of the psych. Yeah, because the, the queen and, killed um, the previous psych leader. Psych. Right. And he is like, oh my God, there's another Spearly. I didn't feel like their connection felt very, like, the relate Alton should have been built up more during the school arc. Mm -hmm. Um, and he wasn't. And so then his personality is a little bit vague now when they're interacting. And also he doesn't seem like as happy as he should be that he's not alone and that the, the other Spearly is a hot girl, um, who they don't need to use birth control with. Maybe um, he's also ace. Is everybody in this book? Cause Katai is, we find out later, um, in the sequel, I think, um, Though that would be pretty funny if everyone in the book was. Anyway, um, this book is incredibly <laughs> un interesting. In My Hero Academia weird quirk, quirk team. team. Yeah, it is exactly like a manga or an anime, and like it's. Uh, I'm hating, but I shouldn't hate. It's it's fun to have you know the cool. It is, of, and I I liked I liked the team. Um, the psych were probably my least liked plot beat because zero character development. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They're... Anyway, she joins the war. She's with the psych team. Except it, it makes no sense how they're using them because the psych team were assassins. During a war, they should be used to assassinate generals. Now, they make a point that, oh, we can't do that because the Mugni's army is so um, uh, not individual. Uh, Which, listed. okay. That makes no sense with what we learn about the Muganis in terms of them being such a horrible army, which we'll find out later. They would be very authoritarian. They're not decentralized. Armies that do uh, that um, are that brutal have to be authoritarian. So, like for example, one of the, I was reading a thing once about why the Japanese army in World War II was so awful. They were awful beyond belief. This book. It even kind of downplays it to almost a certain extent. But one of the things that they talked about is they were so horrible to the Chinese and the Koreans and, and prisoners of war because they were actively abused by their commanders and their authority, their uh, authority figures. Like they were, the troops were treated like dirt. So why would they not treat others like dirt? Um, and so it doesn't really make sense that assassinations wouldn't be important. Basically- yeah, go ahead. That's what this team should be used for. But now they're like, you are now the seventh army battalion. Congratulations. You shall fight in open warfare. Um, but also shamans aren't real, guys, for real. OK, yeah. I got to just. OK, so Mariak says the entire book before that felt like it was about how heritage ethnicity doesn't matter. And as long as you work hard, you can achieve something great things. Psych. No, she could only she only cool, cool because she is of a special race. And then a.k.a. a typical Darman plot. If you know Darman. That makes so much sense. Even if you don't, you should Google him on YouTube. It's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, Lindbergh also says, I think she needed to be Spearly because it forced intimacy with Alton, the real drum in it. What, to really drum in what an impact what he has on her. Has on her Which yeah. is, um, or I think Kwong felt she needed to be Spearly. So um, one of the things that we learn here is that she can't access she, firebending um, for some reason without her life being super in danger and Alton is training with her and they can't figure out why. She also doesn't have gold eyes, which all the Spearly had, which whatever. No, 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 red things. eyes. But they have it during shot when they're doing shamanistic Right, stuff. yes. That, she she so can't <clears throat> she can't do that and so they're like, okay, and Alton is getting annoyed with her and like slaps her at one point. Yeah. Because um, Alton's like not doing great. Yeah, so the, the thing here is that she is afraid of the uncontrolledness of her power. Every time she's accessed it, she has not been able to control it versus Alton who can like call it on a whim. He has super precise control of it. And so her inability to connect is through fear. At first he's very patient with her, but as the war continues and they are in like a coastal city, um, like a, a port city. And as things go terribly there uh, and that the Muganese keep outmaneuvering them, he gets more and more upset. And there's a character who comes in who basically says, Alton has been best boy, does the best things his whole life. He's used to praise. He is not used to failure. And he keeps disappearing. They get into fights. Uh, it's not going great. And she is a terrible, terrible um person in the military she doesn't listen she doesn't take <laughs> orders like she just oh man not great anyway um her and his lieutenant uh, alton's lieutenant kind of butt heads he is a shaman that is not connected to a specific god he is from um 
the like hinterlands um and he just goes to the spirit realm uh and spends a lot of time there but he's not directly connected to a certain god he does go and talk to uh, a prophecy creature that is there and like once every moon cycle you can go and ask a question um and she ends up talking with that guy uh because he she was like there's a woman there blocking my path i can't go i can't commune with the phoenix because of this woman and he's like okay let me help see if we can deal with this and when he goes he kind of sees the woman and he makes a connection that we don't fully realize until later but they end up going to the magical creature that answers questions through riddles um <laughs> like this, the asian sphinx the prophecy um and asks her like and the thing was it was one of those things where like she said what does the phoenix want me to know and none of this felt like things that the phoenix would want her to know but it basically is a prophecy about the war that um uh gives them enough of a gives the the guy whose name i'm completely forgetting but it's alton's lieutenant his second in command gives him enough of a thing to realize that the entire altercation at this port city has been a distraction They've been going through a, a different, uh, the Muganese have been trying to go a different way. And so they end up capturing, uh, like, they come out of the spirit realm. They go to Alton and they're like, hey, this is happening. Alton's like, okay, we captured a dude. Uh, also, uh, she thinks Nedge is dead. Again, he died in a gassing. This was another thing. Like, uh, the Muganese had a lot of, like... Uh, weapons that were things used in world war ii that weren't like great that wouldn't have been used in like a medieval era because like it's it's yeah this is a modern if there had been a more clear delineation between the idea of the shamanism the nikon being pro shamanism because they're not standardized and the jab or the the muganese losing shamanism because they're more but they have like cool steampunk powers like poison gas um that would have made a little bit more sense, but instead it's like you're just borrowing from World War One and Two in terms of how awful the Japanese are, but it doesn't actually make sense in sense a for this time pre-industrial period. setting. Yeah, and also, guys, poison gas, not really effective. There's a reason nobody really uses it after uh, World War One. Yeah. Anyway, um, she thinks Nedra dies again. Um, it, it upsets her. She also gets mad at Alton about it. This is what causes them to slap each other, and it is during this slapping when they're, we're having this fight, oh yeah, I forgot about this, that she's able to tap into through anger, through anger and hatred. In a moment, she hates Alton and, and the things he's saying, and she like, phoenixes out at him, but then he phoenixes out harder and is like, I got more fire than you, and she has to like back down. Like, mm -hmm. like there was a, <laughs> a, a, a dominance thing, and, and she had to back down. But anyway, her and What's-His-Face uh, come to him and are like, listen, he was like, oh, during the gas attack, we took a prisoner. Let's just, <laughs> meanwhile, Alton is the Hulk. That's my secret cap. I'm always angry. That is, a... yeah. I hated that. I hated <laughs> that. I hated that. Anyway, uh, so they, they do a torture sequence. There Sorry. we go. They I do a torture... myself instead of you. Calm down. They did a torture sequence where they like torture uh, this guy that they captured to say like, where is the army actually heading? What's the actual plan? And he, as per usual, in fantasy novels confesses everything um and then yay for torture working effectively in four yeah. of the books we're now working guys oh, torture no. is not an effective form of um Spine. intelligence gathering i don't understand like seriously why didn't he just lie here yeah. He doesn't know, like, whatever. Well, we'll, we'll, yeah. whatever. Because unfortunately, torture works. It, it, not, never mind. We're not going down that route. <laughs> Torture's bad, go. isn't effective. Let's keep going. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so they're like, oh, shit, they're actually going to come in through the mountain pass, which gave me a little bit of like Mulan vibes. Um, and they were like, they're going to attack this one city. We've got to go get to them. So they're like, they do a heck and go <laughs> and they're, they're running. And then like they're, they're following a river and all of a sudden they can't get past. And like, they look and the river's got blood in it and there's bodies just floating down the river. I am not going to describe anything else from this point, but they get to this city and it has been massacred incredibly, incredibly, incredibly brutally. It was very difficult to read. If I had been reading this book for pleasure, this would have been a moment and not because like she wrote it badly or anything, but just because this is the kind of thing where I'm like, ah, oh, that's a bit much for me. Like I just, oh man, if this is a good um, one. I, it didn't really hit me, but the thing about it is that not that it's badly written or anything, but like uh, sometimes p things hit uh, people differently. Like, you know, um, 
uh, that scene in Hyperion, the guy, the priest on the tree living and dying for seven years, mm -hmm. that hit me in a way that stuck with mm -hmm. me for weeks. This didn't hit me that way, but there's no real reason why. But because, yeah, it is a hardcore scene. It's basically the aftermath of the strike on Nine King in real life history. And it doesn't really. Yeah. So, like, not that you always need to explain why people are bad, but this book is super long, and I felt like it would be, have been much more interesting if there had been more an examination of why are the Muganese like this? Like, how what forms their society to be this insanely racist and savage? Um, you know, and you don't even have to be complicated about it. One of the things that really works about one of our favorite movies, uh, Fury Road, is that there is a character who is sort of a reformed grunt from the uh, um, the bad guys, and like through his character in like three scenes, you get oh, this is their culture. This is why the do they do the things they do, and especially if she's going to genocide the whole island at the end of the book, there needed to be a better argument for it. this society is just geared towards war. They're not going to stop unless I burn them all. Not that that's the correct thing to do, but that is her understanding of it. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so it was hard to get through reading this stuff about because um. Uh, Amanda said Venka's story had me shook. That was so, like, and, and the, like, ugh, ugh. yeah, that hit me. And I was like, okay, are we really doing this? And also, why are we doing this? Again, if you're going to go dark, you need to make a point. And I don't really understand the point of this to an extent. And, and that's, that's my point is if we're recontextualizing something in a fantasy setting, we need to be saying something about it that isn't being said in the original. And here's the thing. Maybe that's me uh, imposing uh, like if, if you're going to redo something, you need to be saying something new. Maybe that's me just imposing my wants onto something. Like if I have to relive something that was terrible, like at least be doing something new with it. Like, and, and maybe you don't have to, maybe this is how people process things and that's fine. But for me, it just felt like one of the things the author things mentioned for terrible is that things she wanted to, to explore Chinese military history because it wasn't as explored as Western military history and fantasy. And I'm like, but but why like there's military history and then there's slaughter and the other thing about this is that putting this in a pre-industrial and pre-colonial setting changes the context somewhat from having it in a post-colonial post um uh industrial yeah, setting you have the, the the whole colonialism of uh like these countries and everything and and their choices like hesperia is just like a tiny and, and not like it was weird how the the world war ii was so steeped in western influence and colonialism and yes. to tell this story in a pre-colonial context really just like i, I don't want to say it felt like westerners got off scot-free no yes. responsibility okay so but here's the thing felt like that I don't necessarily know a lot about Japanese culture in relation to feeling like they are Ubermen. I don't know how much of that is a translation of the feelings they got from colonialism because the Japanese did adopt Western ways extremely fast. And that's one of the reasons they were able to do World War One and World War Two. So I don't necessarily know about that. If you do know more about um, Chinese racial uh, supremacism, leave it in the comments. Japanese, that's always interesting. Uh, yeah, Japanese. But in pre-industrial ages, it was they did not have the same conception of race or Uberman that they did in a post-colonial one. They just straight up didn't. And it was actually sort of common to massacre people, like especially in sieges. The deal was either you give up now and we won't kill you or you don't give up and we have to go through the siege and then we kill you all. This is a thing ancient armies just did a lot. You look at the Mongols. Mongols were awful and they just did some absolutely horrific things. And it's not just like a, a barbarian thing. Rome absolutely awful look what they did to carthage look what they did to masada the, in pre -industrial, the, um, the crusades the crusades um it, it, like armies and, and you really have to grade morality differently back then than military you do now. Man. yeah it's so it's like putting it in a pre-industrial pre-colonial setting changes the contextualization of it a lot like do the Mugen view that there's one scene with a Mugen ambassador who like does some sabotage which i kind of thought was dumb but whatever um where it seems like they think that the nikon are an inferior race but then like are they trying to wipe the nikon out so that they can then build on their land like is this a manifest destiny thing like one of the things people don't understand about world war ii is that um the racial superiority of the nazis was even to like eastern europeans like one of the reasons they killed so many polish and they killed so many polish is because they literally wanted to reclaim it for the german ethnicity um, it was a manifest destiny in the same way that the U.S. had the manifest destiny of going to the, the West Coast. 
yes, the West Coast. Um, all of the scenes are very complicated, and this book doesn't talk about any of them. And so it feels somewhat like the Mugen, the Mugen either feel like, A, ooh, we're super evil, awful, or we're talking about the Japanese during World War II. And neither of those help the story that the author is trying to tell, especially because of the story the author tell, trying to tell is not super clear. Uh, let me look at the comments really quick. It's just really weird to completely remove Western influence from the, like, th those events happened due to colonialism and Western influence. And not to say that, like, any area of the world didn't do terrible things without Western influence, but, like, that's the context of World War II. So it was just, it was weird. Anyway, continuing, unless you find something interesting to highlight in the comments, Will, um... They get there. It's really bad. She realizes her friend Kitai's uh, unit had been sent there. So she's like, she's looking for him. He happens to have survived by hiding under some dead bodies and stuff. They join up forces. Um, she is incredibly angry about all of this. And Alton is seething because for him, this is a replay of the massacre of the Spearleys. He lived through the massacre of the Spearleys. Um, and actually he didn't even one of the things we learned and i don't remember where we learned it i, I think we're going to learn it in a bit so i'm not going to mention it now but we'll get there um anyway he's super pissed because it's bringing back a lot of his trauma and he's like we need to end this and he's like the way we're going to do it is we're going to go to the mountain where we bury all the shamans um and we're going to free them and i'm going to have an army of shamans and we're going to wipe the muganis off the face of nikon um and uh his lieutenant is like that's a terrible idea the people who are locked away are people who are no longer like have their human side of them they are all the gods that took over them they are now and because the gods work for themselves they do not care about the human costs and things they are capricious they are their own creatures um and so when a shaman who is connected to a certain god loses themselves and becomes too much of the god they get shoved into this prison under this mountain um, where their powers aren't able to be used. And he's like, no, I'm just going to go open the doors. Fuck it. We're going to do it. Um, and she also realizes in this moment that that's probably where Zhang put himself. Like, there's this idea that he interned himself in this prison because of, you know, using his powers when he shouldn't have. Um, and so they're like, we're going to go to the mountains, the mountains, the mountains. Um, uh, oh, wait, somebody said something. Uh, Silky Bellian. Lian. Lian. Um, okay, so the entire reason China had the opium wars was because of the UK. They'd colonized uh, part of China, now Hong Kong, and they had major shipping points stealing in opium. Yeah. Yeah, and that was opium... more of a, a Chinese thing, so or a, a UK yeah. Britain thing. So it's weird to transplant it to the Japanese. Yeah, and the opium wars were One of the... China combating this. I, I like about Take a Shot, guys, A Song of Ice and Fire, is that Martin likes to remix history in cool ways. So you can be like, oh, this character is kind of a reference to uh, Alexander the Great, or Valeria is kind of like Rome in this way or that. But he doesn't do a one-to-one. -one. It's more of just kind of a melding of them. And I think that's a better way of doing it, because if you do it this way it's too close and so you your brain is unable to completely uh separate the two and deal with this world as a thing on its own yeah anyway so they decide to go to the mountain they go they get in and they find jong's thing first they're talking to him and uh he's like ah hi my apprentice and the guy that i couldn't save how, how are you doing and they were like why are you here you got to help us you've got to like mugen just completely massacred um golden niece like we have to do something and he was like no 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 uh and she was like but you literally did that at synagogue at the gates you opened the portal we literally had to fight a face monster because of it um and uh he's like yeah, I shouldn't have. That was a mistake. Look at the repercussions from those actions. This is not how we should handle this. I, I thought I taught you better. And she's like, no, we need to do this. And he basically is like, nah, I'm out. I'm not helping you. And he like reseals himself up into the stone. Uh, and then they go to this other dude who is the human vessel for the god of the four winds who is super capricious. I mean, as the winds are, are they a nice breeze loving you or are they blowing your house down a la Hurricane Ian? Um, 
<laughs> cultural context um, for topical. Floridians. <laughs> topical. Um, topical. I'll anyway. put it in the uh, the keynote keywords. Anyway. Um, and, uh, so they go to this guy and he's like, I am, you know, like he's not the human that, uh, and, and, uh, Alton knew this guy, like he, he would interact with him, um, back in the day. And he was like, no, I know you're in there. Cause Alton does a really good job. There's this one guy who's like, uh, the shaman vessel for a monkey God. And he sometimes goes a little cray cray, but then Alton is able to like bring him back down to himself and he's like a kind, sweet guy. Uh, and so Alton tries that with this guy. And he's like, yes, I shall help you. And then they release him. Um, but then when they come out of the uh, underground, uh, they're, uh, the Mugani's army is there. They come out of the mountain. And the Mugani's army is like, hey, guys, we're going to capture you. So they capture them. And You, you learn... have no magic powers right now because you no... you're still in the mountains. Yes. And you learn a bit before this that the reason that he is one of the last of the Spearly, the last, it was assumed, before she showed up. Spearly is because he had been kidnapped as a child because the Muganese were really into figuring out what made the Spearlies work. You know, there were these magic, this magical race that could access across the board the Phoenix God. And they were like, what makes you, what makes this work? And so they would, like, perform vivisection and just a lot of torture things. This is again a reference to Japanese um I forget what it is it's like section 703 or something like that a very real thing they did with like vivisections um it's again I mean Japanese are just awful during World War II um and it's again military, one of these yeah. military navy um air force yeah, yeah and he, the, the war side of things so. yes no very much so um and uh so it's again one of these things where it's like this is kind of close to a thing, but it's not, doesn't really necessarily make sense because, okay, again, it's not as though Nikon is the, like an unruly bunch of shamans and the Jap and the Japanese analog, the Muginis are trying to, in their industrialized scientific way, understand and grab their power. That's sort of an interesting conflict, but it's not here because the Nikon also don't believe in magic. Um, yeah. Uh, again, messy doesn't totally make sense. Yeah. A little too close to a real world atrocity. What are you trying to say with this? Anyway, so he grew up like in in that setting as a young child being uh, tortured. That's where he got addicted to opium. She finds out that he's a, at a previous point that he's addicted to opium um, and it shakes her. She's really upset about it because, again, she doesn't really have a great opinion of opium. But what she figures out is that he uh, the 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 that's my secret cap. I'm angry all the time. You <laughs> access the Phoenix through hatred and negative emotions. And he has so much. He is so angry and so full of hate all the time. He's always able to access his powers and opium uh, is a way for him to feel nothing to, to be separated from those emotions. And it was what the um, Muganese used to control him when he was a child uh, and something that has lived with him since when he was taken out of those that like lab and brought into the Nikon. They also used o opium uh, like throughout school. He was using it uh, kind of thing. Anyway, and so now they're ch captured and they're back. Like, he's back in the, like, lab with the same, like, doctor, scientist, evil scientist guy who was working with him before, who was like, now I have two of you. <laughs> um, I did like his character. He's like a very creepy scientist grandpa. Mm -hmm. Well, well sketched. It makes sense. I'm not in the book a lot, and I don't think it makes up for the other problems with the book, but I did like that touch. Yeah. Anyway, um, and, uh, they're uh, they they're really scared of him because like he's got all the powers so they're not really controlling her that much and so she ends up like doing heckin spark spark uh and like burns the place down she releases alton what and and he basically yes they burn the place down to get away he's like you got to swim to the spearly island um i'll cover you they do they kiss or do they just touch heads? I think they just touch heads. I think they just a, touch like... heads. It never gets like overtly romantic. But the thing is here that like they've established that for her to fully make her connection to the Phoenix, she has to go to the altar of the Phoenix on the, the Spearly Island, which is like a swim away. And I didn't get this because like, like burn everything down and then you both get into the water and swim. I don't <laughs> really understand why he had to like 
the logistics of him having to sacrifice himself don't totally bomber make sense. Himself, because um, that's what he does. He literally yeah. like it, it just burns <sighs> out and bombs himself. Um, and unfortunately, this should have had an emotional impact. I was more upset that Neja died. Then that I didn't think Neja was, Neja was staying dead because he has, they mentioned beforehand, he has a shamanistic power of healing. So I was like, Neja's not dying. I think yeah, but like I cared about her reaction to it. Um, and Lindbergh says he didn't want to live anymore, which, okay, that's fine. That makes sense. I get yeah. that. No, I mean, that, that does make sense, course. actually. Yeah. I guess. Um, so basically, she swims to the island. She does a, God, a so heckin' many trigger meditate. Wordings. Sorry, she guys. She does a heckin' meditate, as uh, Maria would say. Um, she sees the the lady in her dreams who's just trying to keep her away from the power of the phoenix, and she's like, it, fuck you. The old queen of the Spearleys. So the, the Spearleys joined uh, Nikon uh, because of this woman. She was unable to protect them, and what it was is that the phoenix was like, I shall give you more of the powers and stuff, and she's like, you take too much. You, you are literally a bad thing. The queen of the Spearleys realized that the phoenix Racist. has an undenying hunger that would just continue to eat and eat and she was like i will not continue to do this anymore so she killed like also we also and find out that the way that the nikon were controlling the um spiralies which everyone was like how do they control this island of awesome warriors is that they gave them opium, opium. that they could do dull the uh, power of the phoenix who was always hungry which i thought was kind of interesting basically she talks to the phoenix though and is like he's like do you want my power and she's like, yes. And oh, he's wait, like, I, a motivational arc. Where we are now. <laughs> I forgot oh, okay. to mention. Good point, yes. I forgot to mention. Where we are now, motivationally, is we need to destroy the Muganese. Not, so we were, I, I, I didn't want to get married. Uh, I wanted to make sure I stay in school and not have to leave. Uh, and then um, I want power. Uh, and then like, I want to do, there was, there was actually like a 3.5, which was, I want to do well in the military and now for genocide, um, lots of jumps, uh, and, and not just like, I want to crush the army, but like specifically the Muganese. Um, Again, the deal she makes with the Phoenix is if you, it, okay, destroy the Muganese land. And then I will repay you for doing that by killing more people, which made no sense and, to me. Yeah, and like by doing, continuing to spread your hunger, kind of thing. Um, and it, it's yes, number six. it's really it's really strange because, uh, like Will said before, it would have worked better where I want your help to uh, like I want your power. I want to be able to protect the people I love. I want to be able to protect my country. And she's like, okay, but then let me use. If the Phoenix had been like, okay, yeah. let me use you as a funnel to do something because chaos and uh, negative feelings feeds me. And a really easy way to do that is to just like nuke an entire island of people. Anyway, and so she, the Phoenix is like, I've been waiting for you to ask this whole time. Of course, yes. Um, so she does the thing and mushroom clouds the Muganese uh, nation. Island. It's literally island. described as a mushroom cloud. Um, and it's like the the bow, the bow island, like a yeah, it's what they call yeah. it. Yeah. Anyway, and she ends up getting rescued by the Sykes who have, are on a ship, and like he ties like go to the Spaley Island, and they find her and they get her, and they're like, what happened? Da da da. And then he ties like, tell me what happens, and she's like, I kind of think I'm the one who mushroom clouded that like thing, and she's like, he's like, what? What what? What did you do? And also, uh, the Phoenix tells her something. I don't remember if the Phoenix tells her or she learns this previously, but I'm pretty sure it was the Phoenix. The Phoenix tells her that the person who is responsible for uh, them getting captured and betraying the psych was the queen. Because the queen was the only one who knew where the mountain was. Uh, and I guess knew that Alton was going to go there. I don't, that part. Yeah, I didn't fully he, understand. Alton had only told the Empress that they were doing that. So it must have been her who, who set up the trap for them. Uh, and again, and now she's the one in control of the psych, and she's like, "Okay, the war's not done." They also, the psych also did a thing where they killed, wiped out a bunch of the Muganese army, and she's like, "The and, war's not done, though. We need to deal." And with the, the the like released a dam which flooded like 
it also affects uh, the Nikon people because it flooded an entire valley. Some people's homes are gone. Some people are dead. And it also is going to greatly impact all agricultural production for the next few uh, years. So, like, everybody's doing some not great things. Um, uh, ba, ba, ba. Dr. Shiro told them, you're right, it was oh, okay. Dr. Shiro. The, the terrible Mugani's doctor who was torturing them was like, it was your queen, the empress. She did it. She told us. Uh, and so now we went from, like, genocide motivations to she's now kind of forgotten her genocide motivations. And she's like, we're going to get the empress. Bum, bum, bum. Time to kill her. Um you really should give me more time to set up the motive. We should have done this beforehand. That would have been very funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and that's how the book ends. <sighs> and to Marika's point, she just let the actual soldiers, the people who had done all of those horrible things live. They're still alive. They are still in, like, why not become like a Phoenix personification and burn down their camps and their supply lines? Like, why wasn't that the horrible act that which is still a horrible act but why wasn't that what we did like i mm -hmm. don't understand like you hurt my people i'm gonna hurt yours. there's a jump people. there's a massive jump and again it's not as though she has learned okay the muganese culture at this point is geared towards war and racial supremacy they are not going to stop even if we wipe out their army again that's a somewhat more understandable we need to burn this whole thing to the ground and, and, and restart or whatever again awful and not the correct thing to do but makes a little bit more sense we kind of already covered a lot of the problems with it at the beginning in terms of the genocide um, and how that relates to the real nuking of Nagasaki and um, Hiroshima, which again, awful things, but done in a very different context and also down an entire island. Yep. Like just not an entire island. Miss Ali Snow said, good thing she didn't go into strategy. <laughs> 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 anyway and that's basically how the book ends uh and it's just so again there's so many things we didn't fully get to touch on like the shamanism the connection the fact that these people lose their humanity at a certain point by getting access to this power the fact that there's the whole trifecta like because we have two parts of the trifecta that are confirmed the um uh, Viper is the Empress. The Gatekeeper was um, Jong. Uh, how is that going to play out? There's just so many things happen uh, happening in uh, this book that aren't, I, I don't think are fully explored. And I think Lindbergh really hit the nail on the head. This I think the author was so wrapped up in the themes and trying to fully encapsulate those things and the things that she was like alluding to very very specifically that the a functional independent narrative kind of took a back seat mm -hmm. again i think this writer is a talented writer i think there are there were scenes that were very impactful there were things that went uh well and i think it's just like number one scope this this book was a massive and it had too many there's three arcs yeah. there's three things this should have been three books and I think it would have worked better. I think I've noticed this a lot in our reading is that there's been a shift from when I was young to stories that are trying to be more political or geopolitical uh, instead of just action adventure. And um, that's kind of just the mode that people in the genre that people think is smarter and, and more likely to write. But the problem is that that's so much harder than going on a quest with your buddies to destroy the ring at the mountain. Like that's such a harder thing to balance. And in this case, especially it's like, you don't really have the chops to write this, this geopolitical story and, and his um, military fiction. And then also shamanistic unrest. Like there's so much going on. This should have been two books at the least and probably three. Yeah. Um, and also work on your motivations and don't make this just a one-to-one -one carbon copy of, uh, real historical events um guys in the comments tell us what your overall thoughts were on the book as we keep talking and i'll i'll talk about them or anything you did you think we missed anything that we we should have talked about let us know i'm, I'm um, gonna pull up there were some really good comments last week uh because some of the people are not here this week um i'm going i'm going to the discord one one moment i will uh keep you entertained ba 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 Ba, 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 I don't know. Read ba, some of the other comments. What are, you, what are you doing? Stop. Um, so Amanda said, I mean, remember when she proposes to wipe out the entire River Valley? To be honest, it kind of is foreshadowed. It is. But um, it's one of these things where 
No, I mean, it is foreshadowed that this is a possibility. Um, it actually, I would have preferred if something like that had been her final choice instead of wiping out the home islands, or even if by the end of the book, she was like, okay, you know what? My plan now is to unleash the shamans. That is a more reasonable thing than just straight genocide. Like straight genocide is just, that is a real tall order to go into um, than uh, some of the other more kind of means justify the ends kind of things that she could have done um it, it's it's such a jump in the motivation that i don't think really works very well so uh, amanda says i kept reading the series it gets better but it's problematic however it would benefit from a different format but overall for me who reads mostly european fantasy i found it refreshing I don't know. I like not that I disagree or whatever, but like I didn't find the Asian setting to be particularly well realized. And I understand that the author is Asian. Uh, she's Chinese American, I think. Um, so like she doesn't necessarily she doesn't necessarily have to make it super Asian -y or whatever. But I didn't find the atmosphere of it to be particularly different than um, a lot of just standard fantasy. So some of this stuff, because uh, Celestine, uh, Celestine, um, who was there last week but wasn't able to attend this week, um, she she was one of the people who really made the point that it, the form was weird. A graphic novel would have potentially worked better because, and then like I said, you could shorten it into the individual arcs. There was discussions about. Um, whether people liked Rin or not, like she said, she didn't mind. But as uh, a couple of us have, some of the people have mentioned that, like, if you don't give a crap about Rin and you aren't because you aren't following her motivations, it becomes very hard to be invested and to like cheer for her as the uh, oh, story is going. Uh, Amanda is Celestine. She says here. Oh. Never mind. Really? I thought you were Amanda on the um Discord as well. But... Amanda in Discord. Oh my god, never it mind. Might be it that is they just... Oh, oh. <laughs> this is God, it's so confusing. Anyway, yeah, continuing. She is here. Never mind. I said nothing. Um, um and Okay. So... One of the things I, I just really quickly, yeah, I'll agree with the fact that I found Rin to be a compelling character at the beginning, but she's not one that I thought was particularly well realized, not just in terms of motivations, but like, I can't really imagine what she would sound like just in daily conversations with people. She felt very sort of broadly sketched. Um, part of that again, is there's a lack of internality in terms of her thinking about things. Um, and then also part of it, I think is just that the author is not super great at characters. Like, I, I just don't think she's super great at it. And I think one of the things that would have benefited by making this into sh smaller stories that could have been longer, like they didn't need to be the length they were in this book, but like the school arc could have been a really great foundational way to really put in her ruthlessness that you could have built up like maybe, um, and Lindbergh had said this, maybe she accidentally kills one of her classmates um, and then having to deal with that, come to terms with that, and then potentially having to justify that. And then it would have been a place to further because uh, Neja is humanized a bit. We get a bit of his side uh, during the middle section of the book, the, the military part. But putting that in the first half a little bit and, and being able to really develop their relationship, because it's obviously something that is going to come back. Like, I can tell that it's going to be something that plays a lot into later books. But building that up there and, and having a really solid foundation, but using that time period to really get, like, like maybe Rin is someone who doesn't have actually strong motivations for things she just goes feeling to feeling like she 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 feels something and now that is her justification for that thing and we could have because everything was done through telling so much of this book is told to you it's not actually done scene here's a scene here are characters interacting dialogue it's just being told to you especially during this section you're not getting a lot of who Rin really is outside of that she's willing to put herself into pain uh, to get what she wants and that like military academy school section could have been such a great foundational place to lay her out as an inconsistent uh person who is going to make the best decision for herself whatever she thinks that is even if that had nothing to do with the decision she made earlier that like you could have made that her character but yeah there's could have been a lot um really quickly um Maximilian says a talented writer would have made the story entwined with themes seamless, right? Or do you think this can't be done better by a better author? I think a better author could handle this better. I think in terms of things like prose would have helped um, things in terms of internality would have helped. I do think there is 
a sort of fundamental problem with tying these events so closely to the historical analogs and making this sort of an analog for those. Again, I'm just not a big fan of that kind of mode of writing. I think it made a lot of sense in the past when you were trying to get things past um, censors or when it was more of kind of like an in-joke <laughs> like with other intellectuals of the same era. Um, but in general, I feel like nowadays, if you're going to talk about a thing, you should talk about a thing. And, you know, again, there's a, a butterfly effect with even small details. Um, and then Lindbergh said, the book trilogy has some big problems. The book slash trilogy has some big problems. Many of the character arcs were frustrating and there are elements that to this day that make no sense to me. But overall, I enjoyed reading the trilogy. I mean, it could be. It could be that the trilogy helps broaden it because I could definitely see that some of the... Um, uh, fall out from the end of this book and there could be more um, context given out. I think the problem is that like, this is already a super long book and I don't, I'm not interested in um, reading more. It did not make me go, Oh, I want to read the, what happens next. Um, I'm just kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm done with that. <laughs> Moving on to the next thing. Honestly, this felt like a book that was a really strong first draft, which We've said that before, and I don't want it to come across as insulting, but I think if some time had been put into tracking, like just like plotting out the character motivations, um, deciding how backfilling, yeah, backfilling, but also going, okay, you know, does this work as a whole structure? Um, oh, that's a question. Does the trilogy, uh, Miss Ali Snow says, does the trilogy ever explain how Ren got off of Spear as a kid? Fantastic question. Um, and uh, working on some of those things, because I do think this writer can be a really great writer and could write a really good book. I just don't think, and I think part of it is, if this was her first book, as Will said, this is an incredibly ambitious book. It's like when we talked uh, in our Nona the Ninth, I make the argument that Harrow the Ninth is the... Um, objective like not maybe not objectively but the harder book to pull off because of what it's doing and because it does pull it off it makes it a better book than Gideon and um Nona which are simpler stories um and I uh, I think this book if it had been pulled off correctly could have been incredible but I think it is the kind of thing where like um you have to play around with simpler concepts first. And that's why potentially just starting it with her in school, which is a simpler, straightforward story, building the foundation for things that to come later, like just like Gideon is a simpler story than uh, Harrow and Nona would have been the way to go. Or even um, in Deadly Education, Will has often said that Deadly Education feels like the first half of a book. And then uh, that is building up. Last Graduate to is the next half. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, I think something like that would have worked to make this book better, to give some things uh, some time to breathe. Uh, Novik has actually said that the um, the Deadly Education was supposed to be a duology with that one and then Golden Enclave. And then she realized that the first book was getting too long, so she split it into two. I think this and, and the thing is, like, there are so many elements of this that are ambitious and long in terms of like um, we're doing a historical analog of an incredibly uh horrible massacre and then we're also doing shamanism stuff but also we're doing three really long arcs and we're also doing um the rise of a dictator like those are already four really difficult concepts to nail in one book much less all four in the same book um and so i think it's one of these things where like maybe chill and build up your your uh, strength something i do sometimes in stories is i'll pick one thing outside of my wheelhouse that I want to work in it. Like um, in one story, it was, I want to try to have less character thoughts. Can I, how far can I push just uh, getting through a character's emotion through environmental and uh, dialogue cues? Like one thing at a time to kind of broaden yourself. And I think this starts with like nine things. And this is her first book from what I remember. So yeah, too many ingredients for one book, Miss Ali Snow says. And yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's the thing. I, I think in a simpler book, I think this writer would have done a great job. And listen, I know a lot of people love this book and I can see why. I, number one, I'm not, I don't love books where it's just a lot of bad stuff happening a lot of the time. Like I mentioned this uh, the other day, I think to Will when we were reading The Last Graduate, like I can't watch Breaking Bad because <laughs> it is literally just bad stuff happening the whole time. And I like, as a reader, I need something that I can attach my little fangirls to. Um, and this book doesn't have that. And so part of like, if, if you're looking at it and 
going, wow, I don't think she enjoyed that book that much, but I really loved it. Like, yeah. So Grimdark is something I really have a hard time with. Oh, like, I love Grimdark. I, I, I can, and I have like some of them, but I need something like, I like a lot of there's um what I said in that video was that there's a, a spectrum between Sesame Street and like uh Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad though Breaking Bad isn't the most but just in this one and everyone falls somewhere on that spectrum or I like tend to be berserk. I'm farther yeah or berserk where just nothing good happens um so everyone falls somewhere on that spectrum but I think the farther you get towards the Breaking Bad the better you need to be for the story to be effective um and so there's a certain amount of personal bias involved but i do think there is a certain amount of objective bias um maria has to go now right because we hit exactly two hours yeah so i mean i i'm i've said most of what i needed to say again i can understand why people would like this book uh is it for me no it, this is one of the ones where i really i'm not going to read the rest of the series like i did not enjoy i, I had so many issues with cool prince i'm nearly done with the third book i'm gonna fucking talk about it guys um, we're gonna get uh her and, and katie to do the sequel because i just don't care enough um and then you guys get to get maria's fun instead of uh all cap texting me her disagreements as she watches me and katie's video uh which just came out you guys should check that out uh she can actually say them in real time yeah and and similarly like where there's other ones like uh, mask of mirrors i i enjoyed that book enough that i'm going to read the next because i want to see do my issues that i had in the first book play out long term the problem is knowing that this character is modeled after Mao Zedong I know that nothing good is going to happen <laughs> it's just like let me just get pummeled with bad shit and bad shit and again like that sounds exhausting I am a marshmallow <laughs> I would just read a nonfiction about Mao Zedong, Mao, Mao, Zedong. Mao Zedong's life, and like that would be more effective. Anyway, thank you guys for all joining us. Uh, this was really fun, actually. I like this uh, new program we're using. Um, oh. I probably will just leave this up as a live stream. I like the ability to highlight comments, add banners. You can actually add videos to these, which I showed off to Maria in a way that deeply upset her. Um, but you guys won't know about it. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know. Um, and then also, uh, voting closed today, I think, on the next book, which is the next book, which I will take a moment to tell you now. I think it's going to be Dowry, Dowry of, of Blood, Blood. Yeah. which is um, uh, a Dracula lesbian retelling, kind of. Um, yeah, that one won. Polly? So if you're interested in that, check it out. Polly lesbian retelling subversion. So, <laughs> What if Mao Zedong was a teenage girl? A question that did not need to be answered. That's a weird. It is an odd question. But um, yeah, that's all. Uh, thank you for being with us. Bye, guys. Wait, hold on. You're going to say bye, guys, in the solo, because that's how I always cut it. Bye, guys. <laughs>